Chapter 6 The tires of the cab screeched against the curb. Frank hon on grimly, and for one split second, he got a look into the black car. The two thugs from Bayport. Almost subconsciously, his mind registered the license plate number as the d sedan shot past. Much good it would do him if the taxi wrapped itself around the telephone pole. The vehicle bounced off the curb, shook violently, teetered sideways on two wheels, jolted to a stop, and fell over just short of the pole. A couple of inches more, and we'd have been goners, gasped the driver, pale with fright. Bracing his feet against the steering wheel for leverage, he forced the front door upward and scrambled out. Frantically, he wrenched open the back door. You guys all right? he inquired of his passengers, who had been dumped in a heap on the bottom side of the cab. All right would be an exaggeration, Joe grunted. Let's say shaken up with cuts and bruises, but hopefully no broken bones. How about you, Frank? I'll live, Frank predicted. Just as the boys were climbing out of the taxi, a couple of motorcycle policemen roared to the scene of the accident. The usual formalities of name-taking began. H-A-R-D-Y Frank spelled out. Any relation to Fenton Hardy, the detective? The officer asked. We're his sons. The cab driver, turning livid as his indignation mounted, gave a graphic description of what had occurred. He was delighted to hear Frank report the license number of the black sedan. One of the policemen immediately pulled out a list of stolen vehicles from his pocket and ran a finger down the numbers. Here it is, he said. A little while later, another officer arrived in a squad car with the information that he had found the car itself with open doors abandoned in an alley close by. No sign of the men. Something funny about this whole business, he said slowly after hearing the boy's story. Let's go over and give this car the once-over before we tow it in. While the police examined the sedan, Frank and Joe stood by silently. Finally, just as the tow truck was driving up, Frank inquired if they might have a look inside. The officers nodded permission. The boys saw nothing of any interest and were turning away in disappointment when Joe caught sight of a white fleck at the edge of the front door mat. Just a minute, there's something under the mat. He pulled out the slip of paper. It takes an amateur to teach us our business, snorted one of the policemen and took it. Beginner's luck, officer, Frank suggested. Beginner's bad luck, seems to me, the policeman retorted with obvious satisfaction after examining the paper. You're Frank Hardy, aren't you? Well, this is a driver's license. Take a look. Frank gulped. It's mine. The boys knew they were on the spot. Since their jackets and wallets had disappeared in Bayport, they lacked any proof of identification. They were unknown to the Baltimore authorities and all the evidence so far pointed to a connection with a car theft. Whatever you're up to, you've got some tall explaining to do, the officer warned them. We'll have to book you if you don't come up with an unbelievably fa story fast. Will you believe Fenton Hardy? Joe put in. Sure, if he were here. To begin with, Joe explained, we told the truth. He's our father. Furthermore, he's working on a case here in Baltimore. If you'll just take us to his hotel, he'll vouch for us. The tow truck started moving, pulling the stolen car behind. Since there was nothing more to be learned at the scene of the accident, 
the police decided to take Frank and Joe down to headquarters. There they were placed in the custody of a plainclothes detective for the ride to Mr. Hardy's hotel. They drove in an unmarked car. That's a rough neighborhood, the detective explained. No sense in alerting everybody in sight to the fact that the law is coming. The car swung into a heavily industrialized area, past grimy, smoke-blackened factories and shoddy businesses. Here and there, a delicatessen or a supermarket catered to customers with more money to spend than those who frequented the dingier shops. The car nosed through the toughest area of all, down near the docks. Waterfront characters loomed in doorways, talking loudly. A rolling gait often betrayed the sailor. The varied accents of the foreign seamen indicated that their home ports ranged all around the world from Singapore and Liverpool, from Marseilles to Calcutta. They stopped in front of the hotel where Fenton Hardy was supposed to be staying. Joe looked at the tacky, run-down place. How does such a beat-up establishment stay solvent, he wondered. Entering the hotel, they advanced to the desk. The clerk was a handsome fellow with dark skin and a profile of classic regularity. He greeted the strangers with his palms together and an ingratiating smile. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Looks like a native of India, Frank thought. The detective came right to the point. We'd like to see Fenton Hardy. Fenton Hardy? I don't recognize the name. He can't be staying in this hotel unless my memory is playing tricks on me. Let me see what the ledger has to say. He ran his fingers down a page. No, just as I thought, there's no such name here. Frank and Joe exchanged glances. They had forgotten to tell the officer that their father was not using his real name on this assignment. Now they were really in a bind. What would the authorities think of Fenton Hardy and L. Marks being one and the same man? What would happen if the oily-mannered clerk put two and two together? Still, the truth was the only way out. Have you an L. Marks registered here? Frank asked anxiously. As the desk clerk re-examined the ledger, Joe drew the detective aside and gave him a quick account of his father's alias. The clerk looked up. I'm very sorry, he declared with a smirk that seemed to contradict his apology. There's no L. Mark staying in the hotel either. Shall I search for yet a third name that may be of interest to you? No, thanks. We'll try for three another time. The detective turned away from the desk. Okay, there's nothing more to be gained down here, he said to the boys. We'll go back where we came from and start all over again. Frank and Joe were completely discouraged as they climbed silently into the car. Suddenly, Joe had an idea. Admiral Rogers, he exclaimed. Why didn't we think of him before? We just saw him at the Pentagon. He could vouch for us. Maybe you know the president, too. The detective replied sarcastically. Look, we're not kidding, Frank protested. Will you at least call him? Sure, I've got a hotline to Washington. By the time they arrived at police headquarters, they had persuaded the officer to put in a call to the Pentagon. Frank and Joe listened breathlessly to the conversation that followed. The detective stated his case. Then there was a brief pause. Yes, he continued. Let me see now. You say Frank is 18 years old, dark hair and brown eyes, and Joe Hardy is 17, blonde hair and blue eyes. Yes, the other details check out. You want to speak to Frank? Here he is. The elder Hardy talked briefly with the admiral. Then he returned the phone to the detective, who thanked Rogers for his help and hung up. You're off the hook, he said. Admiral Rogers gives you a clean bill of health. You can go now, and give your father my regards when you see him. We appreciate the work he's been doing. Dad'll be pleased by your compliment, Frank replied. He's a former member of the force himself. Leaving headquarters, 
Joe reflected that they still did not know why L. Marks was not registered at the hotel. Frank nodded. But there's a catch to that. We only know what the clerk told us. Remember, he was the only one who looked into the ledger. He never pushed it across the desk so we could see for ourselves. How can we be sure he was telling the truth? I'll bet my money the other way around. He didn't look the type to inspire confidence anyhow. What's next? A look at the ledger. They phoned Jack Wayne at the airport and asked him to stand by until the next day. We intend to find out whether Dad is in that hotel or not, but we should be back by the afternoon. Returning to the dock area, Frank and Joe staked out the hotel from a small all-night diner, conveniently situated across the street. Hoping for a chance to slip unnoticed into the hotel, it was a long wait. They could see the desk clerk from where they sat, and it seemed he was a permanent fixture. Not once did he move away. Just as they were about to give up, two seamen arrived in search of lodgings for the night. It was now or never. The Hardys watched the clerk, a different one from their Indian friend, produce the ledger to be signed. Then he reached for keys and escorted the men to their room. This was the opportunity the boys had been waiting for. They hurried across the street, slipped through the door, and walked to the desk. Frank pulled the ledger over and opened it. Frantically, he flipped the pages to the current list of guests. Look at this, he whispered excitedly. He placed his finger on an entry where the name of L. Marks was inscribed in their father's handwriting. A large X was scrawled in the margin beside it. The sight of the X marks chilled them, but they had found the information they were after and had to get out before they were discovered. Hastily, they replaced the ledger. They had taken only a few steps towards the door when a harsh voice booming across the lobby stopped them short. I saw you! Chapter 7 Looks as if we've had it, Joe muttered. He probably saw us looking at the ledger. Let's not hit the panic button, Frank replied guardedly. Keep cool, and we'll try to talk our way out of it. The boys wheeled around and walked back to the desk. Feeling uncomfortable under the beady eyes of the clerk, who obviously was determined to question them about their actions. I saw you he repeated. Then he added repro reproachfully, you should have waited a minute or two when you discovered there was no one at the desk. I had to show two men to their room. There is one vacancy at the moment. Do you want it? Frank and Joe needed all their self-control to avoid giving themselves away. What a relief! He had not spotted them at the ledger after all. Now to put up a bold front before he became suspicious. Yes, said Frank to the clerk. We'd like a room for the night. My partner here is Jay Mackin, and I'm Roy Bard. They signed the register, paid in advance, and were shown to a room. Joe sat down on one of the twin beds. Thank goodness we pulled that off safely. Frank nodded. The thing is, we're really in the lines done now. This place may very well be the hideout of the gang we're after, and they wouldn't think twice about rubbing us out. I wonder what's become of Dad, Joe mused. For all we know, he's somewhere in this building. Maybe he's being held prisoner. That X opposite the name L. Marks in the ledger convinced me that Dad's not among his greatest admirers, Joe agreed. Frank stared out the window into the dimly lit street. A car horn broke the stillness with a rushes blast. Four tipsy sailors staggered past, bellowing a sea chantry at the top of their lungs. The elder boy took in the scene before answering. You won't get any argument from me. This hotel gives me the creeps. And we're cut off from the outside world. 
There is no telephone in this room, no way to contact the police. Right. We're a couple of city ducks wondering when the hunters are going to begin taking pot shots at us. The boys, tired and worried, put their heads together in the hope of coming up with a plan. Nothing practical suggested itself. Let's sleep on it, Joe proposed. We can't do much until we find out who's in the hotel and what kind of shenanigans are going on. These beds will probably give us nightmares, he concluded, feeling the lumps in the mattress before snapping out the light. In spite of this prediction, he was soundly asleep when Frank shook him by the arm. What's up? Joe inquired with closed eyes. Wake up, hurry. What time is it? 4 a.m. Joe groaned, that's not a fit hour for man or beast to be up and around. Quiet, Frank whispered. Some funny business is going on next door. There was a heavy thump, shook the room, and woke me up. Then a sound as though wheels were being rolled over the floor. One of them needed oiling because it squeaked. Listen. Low conversation and a scruffing, thumping sound could be heard through the flimsy wall. Obviously, something heavy was being moved. By now, Joe was wide awake. Holy catfish! Sounds as if they're disposing of a body. Well, yes. Maybe. Maybe no. We'd better find out for sure. The two threw on their clothes. Stealthily, they opened their door a crack in order to have a clear view down the length of the hall. Moments late after they took up their vigil, the door to the other room opened. A man came out, glanced around to see that the coast was clear, and motioned to someone inside. A second man emerged, pushing a hand truck on which was a large wooden cask. Gingerly, as quietly as the creaking floorboards would permit, the pair maneuvered it down to the end of the hall, where they squeezed it into a rickety service elevator. As soon as the sliding doors were closed, the boys tumbled out of the room in a headlong dash for the stairs. They went down the steps three at a time. Panting, they pulled up at the bottom. Quick, Frank pointed. Let's get behind that stack of laundry baskets and see what happens when they get down. The elevator indicator moved down to number one. The doors open. The two men eased their hand truck out, still balancing the cask on it. One picked up the handles and began to push the burden toward the back entrance of the hotel. The other guided the carrier, while keeping a hand on the cask to prevent it from rolling off. Silently, carefully, the boys followed. A dusty pickup truck was parked in the back alley. Tilting the hand truck forward, the men raised the cast to an upright position so each could get a grip. Straining and swearing under their breath, they levered the cask up into the rear of the pickup, bolted the tailboard, then climbed into the front seat. The motor came to life and the truck started to move. Come on, Joe hissed. Rushing forward, he managed to get a foot up on the bumper and propelled himself into the back of the vehicle. Frank was right on his heels. They crouched behind the cask, hoping fervently the driver would not see them in his rearview mirror. The truck, gathering speed, moved rapidly through empty streets in the direction of the harbor. Rattling the cask against the meadow, it was standing on and jouncing the boys up and down every time the rear wheels hit a bump. Finally, the driver stepped on the brake, slowing the truck on an oil-soaked dock where the water lapped against the pillings ten feet below. Come on, Frank whispered in Joe's ear. Let's beat it out of here before they get wise to us. The boys snuck one at a time over the tailboard, dropping lightly to the dock and dashed round the back of a nearby dilapidated shed. Wow, Joe puffed. That was pretty close, but I don't think they noticed anything. Frank was peering cautiously round the corner of the shack. They're unloading the cask, he reported. Now they're rolling it to the edge of the dock. There was a loud splash. They've dumped it in the water, Frank said. 
This task accomplished, the two men ran back to their truck and roared off without a backward glance. The Hardys raced to the spot. There it is, called Joe, pointing excitedly. It's sinking fast. He was right. As the cast went under, a cloud of air bubbles began to rise to the surface from around the edges of the lid. Somebody or something's inside, Frank said in alarm, and maybe still alive. There was no time to debate the situation. Both boys kicked off their loafers and hit the water in a desperate dive. Plunging downward, they arched underneath the cask, took hold of the bottom rim on either side, and hoisted it to the surface. With some effort, they maneuvered the bulky cylinder so that it lay lengthwise on the water. If we can get it over to that boat slip before it sinks, we'll be lucky, gasped Frank. Let's swim behind it and try to push it up and keep it afloat at the same time. They soon had the cask bobbing toward the shore. Despite the green slime that covered the slip, they managed to get it out of the water. Let's stand it up right now, Frank said, grunting with effort as he proceeded to do so. Anything we can use to pry the lid off? Joe crawled up the slope from the water's edge and returned triumphantly with an iron bar he found in a pile of rusty junk on the dock. This should do the trick, he told Frank as he applied the bar to the rim of the cask. The lid snapped off and clattered on the concrete. Eagerly, the boys peered inside. Slumped in a heap, seemingly unconscious, was a man in a rough tweed jacket, corduroy pants, and battered brogans. Dad! Frank caught out. Is he still breathing? Yes, he is, Joe answered quickly. Look, he's beginning to come around. He tugged at their father's arm. Here, help me lift him out. As gently as they could, they eased Mr. Hardy out of the cask and carried him up to the deserted dock. There they slapped his face and chaffed his wrist until he, his breathing became stronger. The color returned to his cheeks. He began to struggle feebly. Dad, it's us, Frank whispered into his ear. Don't worry, the thugs are gone. It took the detective a few minutes to realize that he had been rescued by his own sons. In the nick of time, too, he said weakly. Good work, boys. However, did you know I was there? We didn't, Frank said. It was pure luck. And they told their story. Then they turned the bulky container on its side and rolled it completely over. One staff bore the legend Quantico Quicksilver in heavy black letters. I'd call that a clue, Fenton Hardy declared with satisfaction. Quantico Quicksilver is a major chemical company that has been losing mercury flasks to thieves. Frank dubiously looked at the cask. Any point in preserving this memento? No, better put it back in the water before the thugs notice it laying around. The boys carried the cask to the edge of the dock, depressed the open end to make sure it shipped water, and allowed it to sink out of sight. The lid, which had no markings, would only float if tossed in, so Joe kicked it behind some packing cases. Daylight was breaking, bringing sailors and longshoremen down to the docks to assume sea duty or handle cargoes. Soon, the whole harbor area would be as busy as a beehive. Let's go, Mr. Hardy said. They walked back to the hotel, keeping to the side streets, and discussed their next move. Slinking into the back alley, they climbed up the fire escape to the window of the room from which the cast had been taken. They flattened themselves against the wall and listened eagerly for sounds from inside. Several men were stirring around. Spoons clinked in coffee cups. Cigar smoke drifted through the slightly open window. The talk was audible to the three eavesdroppers. Who would have thought Marks was hardy? gloated one of them. Good thing we tapped his phone or we might have never have got on to him. He sure knew how to use those disguises. Only the last one didn't work. Rest his soul in the briny deep, another said with a laugh. He'll never know about the super S now. Chapter 8 The Hardys, clinging to the wall outside the window, 
exchanged baffled glances. The Super S again? What could those hoods know about the missile that had disappeared from the Baltimore arsenal? The men in the room were, they knew, members of the Mercury gang. They seemed to be common thieves, clever at stealing the flasks of liquid metal, but hardly important enough to put a scare into the Pentagon. There was the flat thud of a fist against flesh and the sound of a heavy body falling against the door. Don't mention that, you fool, snarled a voice menacingly. Why not, came the sullen retort, presumably from the recipient of the blow. With Hardy out of the way, there's nothing for us to worry about. We're in the clear again. Oh, yeah. Suppose the feds pick up where the gumshoe dropped out of the case. Do you want them to put us on the run? If you're so concerned, sneered the other, just tell us how the feds could have heard my remark about the subject we're not supposed to mention. I checked this room for bugs myself. Even if they knew we were here, they couldn't tune in. A string of oaths greeted the protest. You talk here, you'll talk where it isn't quite so private. So shut up. A third voice broke into the row. Lay off, you guys. We've got to get on with the timetable. Dumping Hardy among the fish was only the beginning. We're moving into high gear as soon as we get the green light from Mr. Big. There was the scrape of a chair, then the c he continued. Orders are for us to meet here tonight. Break it up for now. You've got jobs to do. I'll lock the door. The Hardys quickly slipped down the fire escape into the alley. Finding the service elevator conveniently empty on the ground floor, they crowded in and soon entered the boys' room. Frank was seething mad. They tapped our home phone? That's how they knew you were Mark's dad. Mr. Hardy nodded. That's one thing I didn't expect. He started to take off his soggy clothes and continued. My strategy worked perfectly at the start. Finding that members of the gang were staying in this hotel, I arranged to have an accidental meeting with them. We happened to be in the elevator together, and I happened to have a light when one of them brought out a pack of cigarettes. Accidentally on purpose, Joe mused. Right, his father said. I managed to make them think El Marx was a gangster. They assumed I was hiding out from the police and needed a job, which impressed them favorably, of course. I'll bet, Frank said with a grin. They were pretty closed mouth at first, but it didn't take long for me to figure out that the ringleader, whoever he is, had indoctrined his strong-armed squad effectively with the need for secrecy. How did you manage to break the ice? Joe asked. By bragging about being a candidate for public enemy number one. I gained their confidence. The chances were beginning to look good that they might let me in on the deal. I'm almost sure I was on the verge of a breakthrough when they bugged our telephone. Obviously, they wanted to keep tabs on me, and what they found out was that I was L. Marks. Mr. Hardy paused to take a shower. When he came out of the bathroom, he rubbed the back of his hand across his forehead and took a deep breath. The effects of his ordeal showed in dark circles under his eyes. He lay down on the bed while the boys cleaned up, then continued his story. I had a hunch they were on to me, so I checked out of here and returned later in another disguise, trying to find out what they knew about all marks. But the entire case blew up in my face last night. Two of the thugs barged into my room. They shouted that the game was up, told me that they were holding you prisoners, and threatened that I'd never see you again unless I gave them my entire dossier on the Mercury case. Did you? Frank asked. I had no choice. They had me cornered by sheer weight of numbers. Besides, they showed me your jackets and wallets. Joe described how they had been stolen at the Bayport repair shop near the landing field. I couldn't understand this bit of petty thievery at this time. He said, now it makes sense. They wanted to be sure you'd play ball. They couldn't have kidnapped us at the airport very easily, Frank went on. 
not with all those people around. So they tried a different gimmick, pretending kidnapping, which served their purpose almost as well, Mr. Hardy pointed out. I got what they really wanted, the information I had gathered on them. Then what happened? Joe inquired. Well, they had no motive to keep me alive and every reason to get me out of the way. They knocked me out, stuffed me into that cast, and took me to the harbor on a one-way trip. Luckily, you two shut up in time. The Hardys pondered their next move. We're in better shape than we were before, Frank commented. Those thugs are convinced that they've disposed of Fenton Hardy. Okay, we'll play it their way. Let them continue to think you're dead, Dad. They won't be suspicious that anyone is on their trail, let alone closing in on them. Could be they'll become careless. Joe was excited by Frank's set strategy. Since they didn't know we're in the same hotel with them, this is the perfect hideout for us. We're their next-door neighbors, so we'll be able to keep an eye on them. An ear, too, Frank added with a chuckle. It shouldn't be too difficult for us to bug their room. That's a problem, Mr. Hardy put in. Those hoods took my electronic equipment. We'll have to achieve it somehow. Frank spoke up. I'll go down and arrange for another night in this room. It would be embarrassing if our hideout were suddenly pulled out from under us because we neglected to pay the bill. And while you're downstairs, how about quit picking up some food? Mr. Hardy suggested. I'm famished. Haven't had anything to eat since noon yesterday. Frank took the elevator down to the lobby. The day shift had not taken over yet. A big relief to him since he preferred to avoid the Indian of the previous afternoon. The night clerk willingly agreed to let Mackin and Bard occupy their room the following night. And Frank paid up. Then he sauntered out of the hotel and into the diner across the street. He ordered a stack of sandwiches along with cartons of steaming hot coffee and was soon back in their room. The sandwiches diminished rapidly under the onslaught of the three hearties. The coffee disappeared just as quickly. They all felt better as they put their debris into the wastebasket. The detective was beginning to be himself again. A couple of hours sleep and we should should be as good as new. That's all we can afford if we're to keep the gang under surveillance. I think one of us had better stand guard in case anyone tries to break in, Joe suggested. Good idea. Joe volunteered to stay awake, since he was not particularly tired at the moment. While the others turned in, he stationed himself in a chair near the window. Turning over the pages of a magazine, he listened to the sounds of the hotel coming to life. The buzz of cars in the parking lot indicated that the day shift was replacing the night shift. The elevator clanged as guests arrived and departed. A low hum of voices from the street reached the room. Suddenly, footsteps approached along the hall. Two men stopped at the door of the Hardy's room, conversing in an undertone. Shall we go right in? Joe heard one asked. He stiffened. The enemy is preparing to charge, he thought. Better summon reinforcements. He stepped around the bed to wake his father, then paused. There's no point in going in there, the second man declared. That's not our room. We're on the floor below. That's what comes of going on a bender just off the ship, replied his comrade with a hiccup. Come on, let's go down before my legs give out. I'm going to snooze the clock around. Joe relaxed and went back to his chair. This kind of interruption I can do without, he murmured. He allowed his father and brother to catch up on their sleep and rouse them at the time agreed upon. Both were ready for action. Anything happened while we snoozed? Frank wanted to know. Nothing but a false alarm, although it gave me quite a turn, Joe told him, and went on to describe the incident of the sailors in the hall. It's good you'd took note of them, Mr. Hardy said soberly. From now on, we have to be extra careful of those we're dealing with. Regard everyone who approaches as a suspect until he clears himself. We'll cover our tracks. A pounding on the door cut him off. Mr. Hardy's voice sank to a whisper. I can't be seen here 
when you're the only ones registered. If you need help, yell. With that, he disappeared into the closet. Who's there? Frank called out sharply. What do you want? Joe slid silently behind the door, prepared to jump anyone who tried to force his way in. It's the desk, Kirk, stated a man outside. You guys gotta get out. We need the room. Chapter 9 What are you trying to pull? Frank demanded. We paid in advance so we could stay in this room for another night. Too bad about that, said the surly voice. But there's been a mistake. We had an earlier reservation the night clerk didn't know about. Another party's coming in, so you'll have to vacate. Frank played for time. Okay, we'll pack our things and get out of here. But how about another room in the hotel? After all, we're paying customers cash on the barrel head. Nothing doing. Every room is occupied. My orders are to get you out before checkout time. Nothing personal, you understand. Just business. Okay, we'll be off the premises by noon. However, you still got the money we've paid in advance. If we don't get it back pronto, you'll have to carry us out. Don't worry, wise guy, growled the clerk. You'll get your dough right now. There was a rustling sound as some dollar bills appeared under the door. Frank stooped and picked them up as the footsteps retreated down the hall. Better see if it's all there, Joe said. It's all here, Frank said cheerfully, flipping the bills with the sun. Bum. They're only too glad to pay off, which means they want to get rid of us with as little fuss as possible. Now that the coast was clear, Mr. Hardy emerged from the closet. The three held a council of war about what to do next. We'll have to work fast and pick up as much information as we can before noon, Mr. Hardy said. Think there's anything in that story about an earlier reservation, Joe asked. The man who came to our door didn't sound like the day clerk we met yesterday. His father shrugged. Perhaps it could also be that they want to clear the hotel of any outsiders. Frank sighed. Well, it's all in the game. We can't take anything for granted. What now, Joe asked. Fenton Hardy gave Frank and Joe a rundown of the main facts of the case. The evidence he had collected before being discovered pointed to a high-power conference of the gang that night, and what they had heard on the fire escape proved it. We ought to sit in on their session, Joe observed, by remote control. How do we get our bug back, Dad? Mr. Hardy looked thoughtful. Those thugs who put me in the cast took it. Before they knocked me out, I saw one of them place my electronic equipment in a closet. If we can only get into the room, we should be able to find it easily enough. In other words, it's time for us to see if anyone's home, Frank chuckled. The hall was empty. The Hardys walked quickly to the room next to theirs where the thugs were staying. Frank tapped on the door. He was sure no one had returned but was prepared to ask for a fictitious person if anyone answered, and then pretend they had made a mistake in room number. The subterfuge was not necessary. No sound came from within. Frank tried the knob. Locked, of course, he stated. His father took a long, needle-sharp gadget from his pocket to pick the lock. Meanwhile, the boys stood guard on either side, looking up and down the hallway, keeping a nervous eye on the elevator ready to give instant warning if anyone appeared. They quickly left the room. Mr. Hardy closed the door, jiggled the knob to be sure the lock had slipped back into place, then led the way to the elevator. Now where are we going? Joe asked. We haven't much choice. I'd say the roof, Mr. Hardy replied. They stepped out of the elevator on the top floor, climbed a narrow flight of stairs, and arrived at a skylight door. Frank pushed it open, and they went on to the roof. This seems our best hideout, Mr. Hardy said, looking around. Might as well get set for a long siege, Frank added. Our friends aren't due back until this evening. They found a corner where the projecting skylight cast a long shadow across the roof, agreed that this was a good vantage point, and sat down to rest and wait. Mr. Hardy pulled the Bayport newspaper from his shirt. Frank and Joe looked on from either side as he flattened it out. 
Hmm. Nothing on page one to interest us, the detective commented. Or have I overlooked something? Not as far as I can see, Joe answered. Maybe there's a clue on the inside pages. They carefully scanned the paper, remarking on stories of the Bayport scene, but found nothing that even the remotest connection with the case. Mr. Hardy said, It's unlikely that there's anything in the radio and TV section, but let's check. Joe whistled as he looked at the first page. Hey, what have we here? He placed a finger at the top of the program listings where somebody had drawn a red pencil circle. That's our local kilocycle number for Bayport Radio, Frank said. The station plays hit tunes nearly round the clock, as you can see from the program. What's the name of the disc jockey again, Joe? Teddy Blaze. He's only been with the network a short time, I believe. What do you make of this, Mr. Hardy inquired. Beats me, Frank replied. Why the thugs would be interested in popular music is a mystery to me, Joe added. When darkness fell, they carried their electronic bug to the power pit. Mr. Hardy readied the receiver, while Joe cautiously played out the wire over the edge until the instrument dangled outside the thug's window. Soon it began picking up sounds of the gang congregating inside. Feet scuffled, chairs creaked, voices buzzed. Bits and pieces of conversation came through. Now that Hardy is out of the way, someone declared, we can get on with the job of heisting the empties. Frank and Joe looked blankly at their father as if asking, what empties? He shrugged, indicating that he was as mystified as they were. Nothing in the talk going on down below enlightened them. Obviously, the gang understood the reference without having the details spelled out. The discussion shifted to topics that the Hardys already knew about. They were beginning to doubt that they were going to hear anything useful when suddenly an authoritative voice issued a warning that made them prick up their ears. I want you guys to get this through your heads. Button up your lips about the Bombay boomerang. We're too close to the big play to let anything go wrong. The whole deal could be ruined if the cops get wise to what we're up to. Breathlessly, the Hardys waited for him to continue. Were they finally going to learn about the Bombay boomerang? So intent were they on the conversation down below that they failed to notice the rising breeze. It caught their wire with a tiny bug dangling at the end and wafted it against the window pane in a series of sharp taps. The window went up with a thump. A head peered upward. Someone's on the roof, a voice yelled. Get up there quick. Chairs scraped and fell over as the entire gang jumped up and pounded through the door. There was no time to lose. Desperately, the Hardy sprang to close the skylight door. What could they use as a barricade? Only a master TV antenna was on the otherwise empty roof. Frank and Joe ripped it down, jamming its metal rod against a solid tin door, using the parapet to anchor the other end. Just in time. The first gangster up the stairway was banging against the door with his fist. Those behind cursed and shouted, telling him to keep going. The Hardys were trapped. No sense trying to climb down the fire escape with the thugs so close behind. There was only one desperate chance. They would have to leap across the alley to the next building. Mr. Hardy went first. Gathering speed as he ran, he leapt onto the parapet and sprang into space, the boys gasped in relief as he landed squarely on the other side. Frank followed, using the same technique. Then came Joe. But when his foot touched the parapet, seeking leverage for the jump, it slipped. He could not stop himself, and he knew he would never clear to the distance. Below him lay a solid six-story drop and the hard pavement of alley. Chapter 10 Desperately, Joe threw his arm forward. His fingertips clutched the edge of the roof, and he hung there, straining every muscle. He knew he could not last for more than a few seconds. Already, his grip was beginning to weaken. He slid back toward destruction. Hold on, Joe, Frank yelled. 
rushing to where Joe dangled hopelessly. Mr. Hardy and Frank grabbed him by the wrists. Hauling frantically, they got him up safely on the roof. Thanks, Joe panted. I hope that was my last cliffhanger. We'd better get out of here before we have company, Frank warned, pointing toward the opposite building, where by now the barricaded doors started to give. They hastened to a skylight door leading downstairs. Luckily, it was unlocked. With Mr. Hardy in the lead, they lost no time in getting to the elevator. I hope it doesn't stop on the way, Joe said nervously. If we're delayed, we might have to hide out in the building, his father remarked. But the elevator went straight down and they hurried to the front door. Keep your cool, Mr. Hardy warned under his breath. We don't want to arouse suspicion. Frank peered outside. The coast is clear, he reported. And wow, we've got help. Jack Wayne is just getting out of a red fort over there. What timing, his father exclaimed. Let's make for Jack's car. Walking briskly across the street, the fugitives reached the ford, jumped in and crouched down on the floor. Frank peeked through the rear window. I don't see the hounds yet. The elevator next door must have stopped on every floor, he said. What about Jack, his father queried. He went into the hotel, probably got worried about us. Joe rose slightly to get a view of the hotel entrance. Oh, here they come, he warned. Duck! Four men barreled out of the door. Two ran in opposite directions. The other two plunged into the alley and continued right around the building. They met again, shrugging in obvious disappointment, and began to argue furiously. Finally, they dashed into the building where the Hardys had just been. Jack Wayne emerged from the hotel accompanied by the desk clerk. They, too, were in the midst of a heated dispute. The pilot insisting that the Hardys must be there, the clerk just as certain they were not. If Frank and Joe cleared out, they'd certainly have let me know, Wayne stated vehemently. Getting nowhere, he broke off the discussion, returned to the car, and jumped in. Frank tapped him lightly on the shoulder. Startled, Jack wheeled around. Easy, Jack, Fenton Hardy whispered. All three of us are here. Act as if nothing has happened and make tracks for the airport, quick. Catching on, the pilot whipped the car out of the parking spot and maneuvered it skillfully through the traffic. The Hardys relaxed. That was simply beautiful, Jack, Frank said. Where did you get the car? Borrowed it from a fellow that I knew from the airport, Jack replied. Since you didn't call, I thought I'd better check up on you. What happened? Nothing really, Joe said. We just had to make a rather unorthodox exit. Our friends at the hotel didn't want to let us go. Soon, the airport came into view. Mr. Hardy's plane stood on a side runway. He went straight to it. We'll wait inside, he said. Give us more privacy than the lobby. Jack, do me a favor. Call Captain Stein at police headquarters and have him come out here if possible. Sure thing, Mr. Hardy. Jack strode into the administration building. Only ten minutes after his return, the captain arrived. Fenton Hardy briefed his colleague on the current status of the Mercury case. The captain whistled. We had no idea the affair was that big. Murder, eh? We'll have to look into that. I'd like to see two steps taken right away, Mr. Hardy replied in grave tones. To begin with, the hotel should be placed under surveillance at once. At least three or four plain clothesmen considering the size of this gang. We don't know who the leader is yet, but one of his henchmen might lead us to him. Right. Captain Stein scribbled a few lines in his notebook. And then? If you could spread the word to the news media that Fenton Hardy of Bayport has disappeared under mysterious circumstances, it would help. And that no clues have turned up. And that the case appears to be running into a dead end. I get you, the captain declared, snapping his notebook shut. When those guys read the story in the Baltimore papers, they'll be more sure than ever that they're safe. You'll have a better chance to find out what they're up to since they won't be looking for you. That's the idea, Captain. I'm sure glad you approve of it, 
makes me feel more secure. Sure thing, Mr. Hardy. We like to have you on our side, too. Well, Mr. Hardy said, I'm flying back to Bayport with Frank and Joe. We have some clues to follow up. It was the middle of the night when Jack Wayne set the plane down at the Bayport Airport. Before we go home, I want to make a call, Mr. Hardy said. It's not the best hour to phone Admiral Rogers, but I have to talk to him. The Admiral brushed aside an apology for waking him up. My sleep is of no consequence when national security is concerned, he said. What have you to report? Then Hardy said as much as he could over the phone and proposed a secret meeting in Pittsburgh the following evening. Admiral Rogers agreed. Then the Hardys returned home to an affectionate welcome from Miss Hardy and Aunt Gertrude. The next morning, Frank and Joe had a get-together with their friends. Nothing out of the ordinary had occurred at the Hardys' house during their absence, the boys reported. If anything had happened, Joe said, laughing, I'm sure Aunt Gertrude would have informed us the moment we stepped in the door. We've come up with another problem, Frank said. What do you know about that disc jockey, Teddy Blaze? He considered a groovy character, Biff related, puts on platters with a real beat. The kids at school are wild about his program. One thing bugs me about him, Chet offered. He's forever chattering about his dog. Tell us his canine companion is named Balto, and then talks to him over the air. Weird kind of nonsense you can't make out. Chet, you may have just given us a vital clue, Frank said. Balto, it's worth checking out. Come on, Joe. Let's see what we can find out at the newspaper office. They located the radio and TV critic in his cubicle writing a review of a Bayport jazz concert. What do I know about Teddy Blaze? He replied to their answer. Not much. He's new around here. Comes from somewhere in the south. Maryland, I think. Anyway, the kids go for him in a big way. If you're after personal information, you better go see Teddy yourself. He'll be at the studio now. Frank and Joe thanked him and had no difficulty getting into the studio when they announced they were fans of Teddy Blaze. The disc jockey had left orders that his fans were to be admitted. Good publicity, said the doorman with a wink. The boys found Blaze in top form, or as Joe put it, flip and insufferable. You fellows look like refugees from the Bach Brigade, he gibbed. Are you beginning to see the light? Does my music provide you with spiritual substance? Frank was nonplussed. That's not the kind of patter I expected, he thought. Hardly the lingo of the hep generation. Joe took up the disc jockey's line. We've switched, but I imagine we're not the only ones in these parts. You must have a lot of fans. You're coming through loud and clear, Blaze boasted, but modesty forbids me to tell you the size of my listening audience. Ask my press agent. He'll be less humble about it. The man gave visitors a sidelong glance and asked slyly, How's your famous father? I'd have given him the big hello if he'd come with you. I dig his detective methods. Joe put on a long face and said glumly, Haven't you heard? Dad's disappeared. Took a trip to Baltimore and hasn't been seen since. Very mysterious. Blaze seemed hardly distressed to hear it. Any suspicions? he inquired in a somewhat mocking tone. Any idea what could have happened to Bayport's celebrated sl sleuth? Plenty of suspicions, Frank answered. But they don't seem to lead anywhere. Perhaps we'll have news about him later. I don't really want to talk about it. Let's get to the music. We came down to the studio to discuss your program, Joe added. It's for a paper we have to write in school. How do you pick the platters you play on the air? Intuition? Not entirely, Blaze replied smugly. Intelligence might be a better word. Look here. This is a list of the discs that are selling best around the country. I know what my millions of fans are going for each week, and I give it to them. 
While Frank deliberately kept the disc jockey engrossed in his own cleverness, Joe walked around the room looking at pictures and records. Then he leaned behind a filing cabinet, holding a record from a, the stock lying on the table. He removed an envelope from his pocket, making sure that Blaze's back was toward him. He scattered some fine powder over the center of the record where the man had braced his thumbs to avoid smudging the grooves. He blew the powder aside, revealing a perfect thumbprint. Guardedly, he brought out his miniature camera and snapped a picture of the print. If there's anything on Blaze in the police files, this should do the trick, he thought. Replacing the record, he rejoined his brother and Blaze, who were debating the merits of two combos that had recently performed in Bayport. As the Hardys took their leave, Blank Blaze remarked maliciously, I hope you find your father. It wouldn't do for his brilliant sons to be foxed on a case where the missing persons happened to be the famous man himself. Frank and Joe pretended to be downcast at the thought. They hurried from the studio as the disc jockey returned to his record and his fans. The boys went straight to the office of Chief Colleg, where Joe brought out his film of the thumbprint from Teddy Blaze's disc. I'll have it developed right away, Colleg agreed and do an immediate check to see whether it matches one of our files. Driving home, Frank suggested that they listen to Blaze's program. Joe fiddled with the knob until he got the right kilocycle. A pop tune came bouncing through the radio. As it ended, they heard Blaze's voice. Hello out there. Ready for an afternoon of the sweet and cool with a dash of hot syncopation? That's what you want, and that's what I've got for you. And now to my dog, Balto. Are you listening? The next number is dedicated to Flatfoot and the Flunkies. You don't believe it? How suspicious can you get? Plenty. Suck it to him. Right up here in Bayport. That's the ticket. Joe snapped the radio off. Is that stuff supposed to be groovy? He growled.